Okay, so you just got the message that we're recording. So we're recording in case anybody's missing it, we'll, we'll send this out just so you know. Um, we also have uh, captioning enabled. So you can click on the captioning button if you want to use captions. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Inclusive You Information Session. I'm Beth Myers. I'm the Executive Director of the Tayshoff Center for Inclusive Higher Ed at Syracuse University. I am also a faculty member in the School of Ed, and I'm so thrilled to have you here with us today. I'm going to do some introductions of some of our staff members who are here with us today, or I'll let actually everybody introduce themselves. I'll start with um, Brianna. Bri. Hi, everybody. I'm Brianna Schultz. I am the Director of Inclusive View. Sam. Hello, Sam Rue. I am the Academic Coordinator for Inclusive View. Carly. Hi, everyone. I'm Carly Grafasi. I'm the communications and operations person here at uh, Tayshoff Center and Inclusive View. So I send out the emails about events like this. Thank you for being here. Jen. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen, and I'm the internship and employment coordinator here at Inclusive View. And Bridget. Hi. Nice to meet everybody. I am the residential coordinator with Inclusive View. Terrific. So I think that's the, I think that's everybody we have on the call right now. We have a really fantastic team, uh, and and uh, everybody is really glad that you're here to join us. So Bree, can you share our slides? Fabulous. Thank you. Okay, so just a little bit, you might hear me talk about the Tayshoff Center. So the Tayshoff Center is kind of um, an, like an overarching center where Inclusive View is located. So the Tayshoff Center is the center, is one of the disability centers at Syracuse University. And it's part of the Center on Disability and Inclusion, but the Tayshoff Center um, does program development, research and technical assistance to other colleges and universities to really think about in increasing opportunities in higher education and colleges for students with intellectual disability. Yeah. And that's really one of the things that we're working on here at Syracuse. But our program itself is Inclusive U. So at Inclusive U, we have 100 students with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are fully included um, at Syracuse. So let's go on to the next slide. Yeah. All right, so yeah. instead of me telling you all about Inclusive View, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to share a video about Inclusive View so that you get to hear from some of our fantastic students and hear a little bit about their experience. So this video is about six and a half minutes long, and uh, we're going to share that. And then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about our program and answer some questions. So let's start there. Every student deserves the opportunity to have the college experience to help them achieve their dreams. Inclusive View is an opportunity for students with intellectual disability to have a full college experience. So students earn a meaningful certificate from Syracuse University. Students declare a major. They participate in fully inclusive coursework. They can participate in college internships in real business opportunities. Students can participate in clubs and organizations. Students can live in residence halls. Our students have lots of peer opportunities and participate in attending athletic events. My favorite things about SU was like just, I mean, everything was my favorite, like being able to be with my friends, doing like all these opportunities that I didn't think I was gonna do. I love SU because it's fun, especially my favorite mascot, Otto. Harry Dyer, Predict View 2020, go Cuse, let's go our house. I think the first time I met Harry was when he came in for orientation. He was a student who, just getting from one room to another, could easily get lost or confused. 
Perry became this student over four years who lived independently in the dorms. He became this student who could navigate campus on his own. When he walks across campus, he knows everyone. He is just a star. This little kid, we love basketball a lot. Harry started working with the men's basketball team as one of the student managers. Harry has always had this love of sports and athletics and it fit right in with his career goals and also with his major. It was something that was really just a, a dream come true for him. Basketball manager. And coming out Saturday is my boys are awesome. And then his senior year, Harry participated in our senior internships. We know that for many of our students, getting a job after graduation is a really important goal for them. And it's an important goal for most college students. The internship year is something that we think is a really important part of our inclusive you programming, that we help support students in choosing something that is tied to their career interests and is related to their major. All of these pieces really tie together for a student like Harry because he took courses in his major area of study and so his major was exercise science. He worked with the men's basketball team throughout his college career and he also did his internships in both the Barnes Center and the Manley Fieldhouse. So those internships really tied into what his career goals are. Often our students go to classes with a peer mentor that can help them with their schoolwork, who can help them organize their materials, help them participate in class, help them participate in group work, help them with their homework. Students can bring a mentor or students can work with us to hire an SU student to be a peer mentor. We set up from the very beginning a peer-to-peer -peer program. It's really expanded the social opportunities for students and really given them that extra first step in how to get involved. We're really proud of our program and how much it's grown in the last few years. Three years ago we had our first student who lived in the residence hall and that was Megan. When I started as a freshman at Inclusive View, I was very shy and I didn't really know anybody. I was the first person to live in the dorms. We work with the Inclusive Youth students to figure out what kinds of supports they might need. Residential mentors are SU students who live in the residence halls and get matched up with our students based on their needs. It was just really hard for me because like I didn't, I guess I, I wasn't used to like living away from home but then I got really used to it after a while and I stayed in the dorm and I met a lot of nice people and everything who like let me like be who I am. Harry lived downstairs too so we all hung out together all the time. To see her graduating from Syracuse University and about to move into her own apartment, I'm just really proud. Cleo was our first Remembrance Scholar from Inclusive U. The Remembrance Scholarship is, is the highest honor at Syracuse University. And to have a Remembrance Scholar as an Inclusive U student is something that we actually didn't know could ever happen. I'm really proud to be part of Syracuse University because of their inclusive stance. It makes me feel good because they know like, I've been supporting this college community here at Syracuse University because they know like, I've been attending every event. My student organization, campus involvement I was part of was Relay for Life. I was a recruitment chair. My sophomore year, I joined Sport Management Club, a student association I'm also part of. I liked it so I could like show my leadership. No dream is too big. Just because somebody told you that you couldn't do these things or just because you were nervous or scared doesn't mean that you can't go out and do these big things in your life because these three prove that it's possible, and you can do it too. This is a college campus where students with disabilities are really part of the full college experience. I'll say I change because I'm, I'm a grow up person. You can do anything that you want to do. I love figure, this is my life right now.
Thanks. We're so glad to be able to hear from the students. It's, it's really about their experience and being able to see what they get to do. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what our inclusive view experience is like. And we're going to hear from some of our coordinators and our directors. And, um, and then we're going to try to save lots of time for questions, because I know there are people on here who really have some specific questions and you might have some questions that come up. So um, I'm going to go over some basics about the program and then we'll get into some specifics. But overall, this Inclusive View is a four-year program. Or it's designed to be a four-year program. Some of our students finish a little bit earlier than that. Some of our students might take a little bit longer, uh, but we're really individualized and we try to think about our students in a really individual way. All of our students are fully included for academic coursework. All of our students come in and they work with one of our Inclusive View advisors to select a major. They can select from majors across the um, course catalog at Syracuse University. So our students major in all sorts of things from sports management to food studies, to anthropology, to history. And uh, students usually select a major based on their career interests, their special interests, their academic interests, and um, select a, a major much like any other college student would select a major. However, our students are working towards, for the most part, they're working towards a university certificate. It's really important to us that everybody understands that this is um, a meaningful university certificate. It's not a special education certificate. It's not an inclusive use certificate. It's not a certificate that we created or made up. It's a Syracuse University certificate in their area of study. Um, so all of our students, get a certificate in their specific area of study, but it's not a bachelor's degree. It's a certificate from Syracuse. They're taking um, non-credit classes or they're auditing classes, but they're taking classes alongside students who are taking those same classes for credit. Now this allows us to make lots of changes to courses um, according to what our students need. So students can, in their classes, have accommodations and modifications. So they can access the regular accommodations that students with disabilities on a college campus can access. So things like extended time for tests um, or uh, preferential seating in the classroom and other kinds of accommodations that a student might need. They can also get modified coursework. So our students work with an academic advisor in our program and might work with their mentor or maybe with their family to think about what kinds of modifications do I need? And they'll look at the course syllabus and they might say, okay, this course requires that I write a seven page paper but that's not really an area of strength for me. So maybe instead of writing a seven page paper, I'll do a seven slide PowerPoint instead. Or um, instead of reading this whole book for this class, we'll select certain passages or certain sections of chapters that might be really critically important to the class. And we'll work with the faculty member to make um, a modified course agreement and say, these are the important pieces of this course, and these are the things that we're gonna access for this student. So having students audit their classes um, allows us to make some additional modifications to the coursework. We do have a few students who have then matriculated into a, pro a program and maybe have decided that they wanna to work towards a bachelor's degree or um, are working to take some classes for credit. And that's, that is something that can be open to students. It's pretty rare, but it is something that happens for some of our students. All of our students um, usually attend classes with a mentor. You can bring a mentor. If you have a mentor that you work with in the community and you wanna bring your own mentor, you can do that. If you um, would like to work with a mentor from our program, we have um, professional mentors and we have lots of student mentors. 
So lots of times our students get matched up with a, a mentor from the university. And those are paid positions where students work with our inclusive youth students to mentor and work with them in classrooms to support them um, in classrooms, working with uh, professors to complete schoolwork, to do homework, to uh, participate in the classroom, to do group work, to work with other students. Um, sometimes mentors do other things too, uh, support students in the dining halls and clubs and organizations, navigating from building to building, uh, doing all sorts of things across the college campus. But primarily, um, our campus mentors support students in their classes. Many of our students get support for classes. We also, um, uh, another, another question generally that people have is how many classes do our students take? A, a typical um, course load for a college student would be five classes per semester. Typically, inclusive youth students take um, two or three classes per semester. Some students might take more than that. We sometimes have students who decide they only want to take one class per semester. And sometimes we have students that want to take, you know, the maximum that they feel like they can handle. And that's okay. Um, but generally our students take two to three classes per semester. And sometimes that depends on whether they're a commuter student or a residential student. Um, we also have what we have listed here as enhanced instruction, but really that means what we're called what we call that are our inclusive use seminars. Lots of times our students will come to us and say, I want extra help with something. I want extra information about something. There's something that I feel like I need some additional support with, or I want to know more about this. Sometimes it's something like navigating the campus. Um, or time management or money management. And so we've put together inclusive use seminars. We usually, we offer seminars uh, just about every day, but these seminars are completely optional. So um, seminars are available for our students to sign up for for the whole semester. They run usually every week. And so a seminar might be every Monday at two o'clock or every Wednesday at 10 a.m and students can sign up for seminars. And we have seminars on creativity in college, self-advocacy. Um, we have one on sexual health, um, relationship skills. Um, we have one on um, health and wellness, using the um, Barnes Center. We've done some on using the 3D printing lab using campus transportation. So we have run seminars on all kinds of different topics and they, they vary from semester to semester based on what the students request. Um, let's see, what else? Okay, supports, I talked about the peer mentor supports. We have um, our staff support. So we have our coordinators who you um, met at the beginning of the call and we're gonna hear from some of them in, in just a minute. Um, and uh, we also have our, our peer partners. So we have our, our peer partners, which is a really important piece to us. We have a peer-to-peer -peer program. So all of our students have the opportunity to get matched up with a peer partner. And those are peer volunteers who are students from across the university. Many of them are education majors, uh, but maybe also a volunteers from other parts of the university. And then um, one of the things that we found kind of early on when we were designing the program was that lots of our students wanted to get involved in the social aspects of college, but maybe they didn't quite know how, or they, they wanted to get involved and wanted to do things, but they didn't want to do things on their own. And I totally get that. I feel the same way. I might want to go to a basketball game, but I don't want to go to a basketball game by myself. I might want to get involved in, in going to a show or, or a play or something else that's happening on the college campus. But I would feel a lot more comfortable showing up with other people that I know. So we designed our peer-to-peer -peer program around that. We have um, a graduate assistant who runs our peer-to-peer -peer program. Her name is Marta this year. Um, and 
uh, she has a group of peer trainers. Our peer trainers are both matriculated students and inclusive youth students. And they look through the, the campus social calendar every week and they put together a list of cool things that are happening on the college campus. And they send it out in like a newsletter every week that says, here's what's happening. And then here's the key. They also send out how to get involved. So a group of us are going ice skating on Tuesday afternoon. If you wanna go meet on the quad at three o'clock. A group of us are gonna go to the basketball game on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. If you wanna go, text Marta. So there's lots of ways that you can get involved. And then there's lots of ways that you can really connect to other people as well. And you can sort of guarantee that you always have a group of friends to go with. And then we have peer partners um, who are always making sure that everybody gets to have the kind of support that they, some support that they might be able to, um, that they might need uh, at a social event. Students participate in clubs and student activities. You heard Cleo talk about it in the video. He was involved in lots of clubs and activities. We have students who are involved in um, the Student Association, Autothon, the belly dancing troupe. Students are involved in all kinds of things at, at our college. And it's one of the things that we really love about being part of a college campus is there are so many, I think there's over 300 clubs and activities that students can be involved in. So there's lots of things to choose from. And then um, we have separate slides on our internships and our inclusive housing options. So I'll get to those in a second. All right, so our internship year, I am, Although we have Jen Quinn here, who is our internship um, and employment coordinator, I'm gonna turn this over to Brianna Schultz, who is now our Inclusive View director, who's gonna talk a little bit about our internship year. Thank you. So after students have completed their academic requirements, most of them are looking towards the final year of Inclusive U, which is our internship program. Um, this is a year for students to really focus on work readiness skills and preparing for employment once they graduate college. So students spend two semesters working on two separate internships for about 20 hours a week, which breaks down to Monday through Friday for four hours a day. Um, in addition to students working on campus in individualized internship sites, we also have a daily employment skills class that students attend prior to going out to their internship. So this employment skills class is specialized curriculum that we've um, curated and um, individualized for students to work on things that are really important when you go to work. Things like communicating with your coworkers, building a resume, how to interview, um, how to request time off, all of those things that you learn over the years, we really touch on in this employment skills class. Students also have access to job coaching. Some students choose Access VR or vocational rehab to um, have support on their internship sites. Other students choose to bring in their own support for a little bit more help um, in training, in interacting with their coworkers, this is real, also really individualized for students. Our focus on the internship year is really on transferable job skills. So if a student is really looking to move into a career in the child care center or in daycare centers, um, we would look at what skills they need and then what two sites might match those skill sets. So a student might intern in our daycare center on campus, but also in an office position where they're learning those organization um, administrative skills that they might also need when they're working in the daycare. Our students also have access to our business engagement group, which is a group of local employers and entrepreneurs who are there to mentor our students, but also be an advocate for our students in our community and also to help connect us to communities where other students live. So if you're not from Syracuse, um, we have connections that could get us to your local community as well. Um, 
We have about 40 internship sites that we are able to individualize for students and we can adjust the expectation or the work that each student does depending on their skill level um, and their area of interest. That's it. Great. And so uh, next up here, just to talk a little bit more specifically about housing opportunities for our students. Um, our students that choose to live in the residence halls do live in fully inclusive Syracuse University residence halls throughout campus. Um, we don't have any specific sort of off campus housing or anything like that for our students where they're all clustered together. Um, our students are in fully inclusive residence halls. Um, we, uh, our students that live in the residence halls have access to a particular type of peer support to try to assist with their transition into independent living. We refer to those folks as our residential mentors. So our residential mentors are full-time SU students who've chosen to live either as a roommate or a neighbor of our inclusive youth students and provide some particular supports to ensure they're successful in their independent living. Um, so these residential mentors might support a student by just like having some check-ins with them and ensuring that they're living in a uh, safe and healthy living environment, right? They're taking care of themselves, taking care of their space, things like that, helping to keep organized. They might try to assist them with some time management around, you know, when to wake up in the morning, when to go to bed at night, those kinds of things when they first uh, are transitioning. Um, they may help the student get adjusted to campus and to some of the facilities, how, where the laundry room is, things like that. And then our RMs are also there for social opportunities too. They're there to help students um, get acclimated to the social environment of living as, in, a, in a residence hall. They're there to go out to events and activities on the weekends. Um, they're a really fantastic extra layer of support that we offer for our residential students. Um, it, you know, just it's important to remember that our students that are living on campus and all inclusive youth students do have full access to all the campus activities, events, clubs, organizations, all that stuff. We have our residential students particularly, but all of our students are doing tons of things across campus from as early as 6 a.m. going to the gym to as late as 12 to 1 a.m. being out at some sort of, um, some sort of event uh, on the weekends. So there's tons and tons of things for inclusive youth students who are living on campus to get involved with. The last thing I'll say on housing is that there are a couple different arrangements that we might do for inclusive youth students. Um, we have some students who are living in single rooms um, because they've chosen that that's the best uh, place for them to be. We have some students who are living in doubles where they might either be living with a residential mentor or another inclusive youth student. And then finally, as you can see in the left picture here, we have individuals who, are, uh, who have lived in suite type arrangements where um, we had four students living together with a common area and one of those four students was a residential mentor. So there's several different ways that we can go about um, placing our inclusive youth students and we do that as a really strong collaboration between the, uh, the student and the family in terms of what we think will be more successful, uh, most successful rather. Thank you. So here's a little snapshot of a day in the life for one of our students. This is Andrew. Um, a student might maybe meet with a peer partner for breakfast or coffee, or maybe just go with the roommate. Um, maybe they work out at the gym with a peer partner or a friend, then meet with a mentor to go to class, study, do some homework, maybe go to lunch at varsity with their friends, then maybe attend a seminar. And then maybe they would use the library or computer lab or just have some downtime, right? There's some lots of time for downtime on a college campus and students have to really think about how they wanna use their downtime. Uh, and then maybe participate in a club or organization. Lots of those happen kind of late afternoon, early evening. Maybe have dinner with their friends and then maybe attend an Orange After Dark activity. Orange After Dark is our campus um, organizes lots of different uh, fun activities for students that happen uh, often late into the night. Um, and these are uh, activities that are centered around 
um, non-drinking but fun activities, things like they'll send busloads of students to the local trampoline park or to the movie theater or to Dave and Buster's or um, there's like lots of different things that, that students uh, will do that will be uh, sort of sponsored by the university that will be either uh, free or very inexpensive. So our students love the orange after dark activities and sometimes those go late into the night. And then we often have a lot of questions about how to pay for inclusive you. And there's lots of different paths that students might take to inclusive you. We have a hundred students this year um, in our inclusive you program and students kind of come through different doors to get here. One of those opportunities is through our collaboration with the Syracuse City School District through our on-campus program. And uh, that is for students who are uh, duly enrolled through Syracuse City School District. We have uh, currently 12 spots for those students. And um, those students are supported through um, this collaboration with the Syracuse City School District. We also have a few um, spots through uh, a program called Access, and that is with a partnership with Onondaga Community Living or OCL. Um, which now is with EFR. We also have um, opportunities for students to enroll um, directly through Inclusive U and then can pay for that program in lots of different ways. We don't want um, payment to be a barrier for any of our students. So we really try to work with our students in lots of different ways. Many of our students, particularly if they're students who live in New York State and qualify for the Medicaid waiver, they use self-direction benefits Medicaid self-direction to um, pay for the program. And many of them are able to pay for the program in full with their Medicaid self-direction benefits or very close to that, uh, depending on if they're residential students or not. So that you can come very close to being able to pay uh, for the full program with Medicaid self-direction if you're in state. Uh, some students are, are private pay. Our students also qualify for federal financial aid, which is a huge accomplishment um, in the field that, that students, um, even if they're not fully matriculated, even if they're not working towards a bachelor's degree, that these students all qualify as and are recognized federally as college students. And so they, they do qualify for federal financial aid that does not need to be paid back. So that's a really significant piece. Uh, that, that works in the favor of a lot of our students. So we encourage everyone to apply for FAFSA when they apply uh, to our program. And students can also use uh, dependent tuition benefits. If you have um, a, a parent uh, or guardian who works at Syracuse University, you can use dependent tuition benefits uh, per class to pay for your classes in, in much the way that other students can. So we can work with you to put together different pieces uh, to put together the best package for you to pay for the program. And applying. So how do you apply? Some of you I see on this call have already applied. I know that we um, are receiving applications right now. Our applications are due January 15th. Is that right, Sam and Bree? January 15th, our applications are due this year. And um, really, what are we looking for? People always want to know, what are you looking for? Because we're not we are not requiring our students to put in something that might be on a traditional college application like SAT scores or your GPA. We know that our, some of our students already have a lot of barriers to going to college. So we're not looking for those things. What we are looking for is, are you the right fit for Syracuse University? Are you the right fit for Inclusive U? Are we the right fit for you? And do we think that we can give you the kinds of supports that you need to be successful at Syracuse University? And that's what we're really trying to figure out through our application process. Sometimes that can be a little bit of a tricky thing to figure out. So we try to get some of that information from our application. And you'll see our application is online. But you'll see the kinds of questions we ask on our application are questions that sort of try to get to those pieces. 
Why do you want to go to college? What do you hope to get out of college? What are you thinking about doing during college or after college? And sometimes you might not know those answers and that's okay too. We just want to know what you're thinking. Um, then we all are, we have an admissions team that takes a look at all of the applications. We look at all the information that you send in. We ask for two letters of support and uh, we look at everything that you send in. And then we schedule an interview with everyone. So we interview every student. You can do that in person or via Zoom. We're doing most of them via Zoom these days. Um, and we have an interview with everybody so that we can really get to know you a little bit better and think about um, what kinds of supports you need, what you're thinking about for college and who you really are. And then our admissions committee meets again and we really think it through and we, and we think through all of our applicants and who we think would be a good fit for our, for our next cohort. Okay, so instead of showing our last video, we're gonna save, I think, the last 20 minutes for questions. Um, I'm not sure how many questions we have tonight, but we wanna make sure that we save some time for questions because there's always, there's always a lot of questions. So we're gonna um, open the floor. Feel free to either use the raise hand button or raise your hand or type your question into the chat or otherwise indicate that you have a question. We've got lots of different ways that you can just tell us that you have a question. While we're waiting, Sam did put the link to where the application is and the deadline just in case. Thank you, Bray. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. Okay, I see a question. Here we go. All right, um, we've got a couple of questions here. All right, so Finn says, when would a student hear about acceptance to inclusive you? We try to keep this to the same timeline as the university. And that is um, the university usually lets people know by mid-March uh, whether or not they get accepted to inclusive you. We try to stay along the same timeline. Uh, what is the typical cycle for deciding on the class? That is when are potential students notified? Okay, so same, same um, question. How do you assess what the student needs academically? Oh, great question. So lots of times this is um, self-reported. So we really are thinking about what our students need because we're working with students and, and lots of times their families and sometimes their mentors to, to work with students to figure out what they need. Uh, we rely on you a lot to let us know what you need in terms of uh, your best supports. One of the things that you should know is that your, um, your IEP that you might have in high school or that you might have had for a long time no longer applies in college. So you might have different kinds of supports. You might even have the same kinds of supports that you had in high school or that you have on your IEP. And we can use some of that information, but that is a document that doesn't, doesn't carry over into the college setting. But we have all of our students um, register formally with our Center on Disability Resources so that they're all registered uh, formally for accommodations at the university. And then we work with all of our students to really even go above and beyond that. But that's a great question. Okay, somebody had their hand raised. Let's see, Dustin and Lisa. Okay, go Dustin. Um, question, am I gonna bring out my uh, um, rates into uh, the- um... The dormitory. The dorm. Are you allowed to bring your weights? This is for working out. Yes, you can bring your weights to the dorm. I mean, unless they're like, unless they're like dangerous, heavy, mm -hmm. then you can bring them. Yes. 
if they're like perfect for exercising, I think that would be really terrific. And I'd be so excited for you to bring them. But have you seen our barn center yet? No, you haven't. No. Dustin, if you like to work out and you like to lift weights, wait till you see the barn center because it is like amazing. It has so many weights and like so many different kinds of exercise materials. You will love it. Okay. You don't want to ask about your guitar? Is that it? Okay. If you have a guitar, you can also bring that. And may, and and we would like for you to like come play it at our parties and stuff. That would be awesome. That would make us super happy. Okay, Michelle. Hello. So my son, David is 18. We live in New York state, we're in Buffalo and he just got his life skills credential certificate but he is allowed to stay in the high school till he's 21. So he has two more years he's doing. Three. Okay. <laughs> Three. Three. He's here. And um, I wondered when would be the best time to uh, apply, get him interested in the program, do a visit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So <laughs> it's totally up to you. Um, so we do have some students who decide to exit high school or, you know, at 18 and come to the program. Then we have some who decide to stay till 21 and then come to the program at 21 and kind of anything in between. We have some students who take a gap year after that, or even longer, some students who take a lot of gap years and then come to our program. So, and everything, you know, we're really individualized. So we have students of all kinds of ages. Um, but I would say that, you know, it, if you're thinking about applying in two years, then come visit next year, get a feel for the program. And you should think about um, one thing that I will, that we will absolutely say is that at least a year and a half, if not two years before you're planning to come, you should apply for the Medicaid waiver if you don't already have it. Okay. Yeah, so we're we thinking have, uh, about using self-direction services. Yeah, we have self-directed services. In fact, it's our broker who suggested this program right. as a transition services program. And we're over the moon because yeah. his dream is to go to Syracuse because that's where his dad went. So, oh, great. Well, because the state is super oh, backed up. Sorry, he'd approving. like to clarify. She's been high school the whole time. Basketball coach, men's basketball coach, been bad. Oh, you like Jim Beheim? Yes, he loves Jim Beheim. Favorite Bayheim basketball coach? He loves the basketball coach, and he's already the manager of his high school basketball team. And he just can't wait to go go to games and hopefully help out and stuff. So that is fantastic. I mean, who doesn't love Syracuse basketball? Come yeah, on. it's great. It's great. I don't want to monopolize, but I just wanted to know in terms of planning and everything. We're still learning. This is our very first meeting. Well, we're really glad to have you. Okay, so I'm going to look at some more of the questions that are in the chat. Um, all right, what are some examples of internships? Um, Bree, can you answer that? Sure. So this list is always building. Um, we have internships in the daycare, in alumni engagement. We have internships in the dining halls and food service areas, um, in our student services center. So some wayfinding navigators in different buildings in our barn center in the reception area, swiping IDs and checking students in. Um, we also have internships in the mailroom in our physical plant, working out on campus with the landscaping. Um, we have a very large list of internships. And if a student is interested in a certain area, we're definitely willing to explore that with the student and see what we can create and come up with. Um, and also, what is the rough number of paid and unpaid mentors across the 100 students? Great question. So we have currently about, I was just adding this up the other day, we have close to 150 student staff, um, about 50 of those are volunteers and another 100 who are employed students um, as either um, student mentors or residential mentors or, um, yeah, student mentors. 
But in addition to that, we have quite a number of students who bring mentors from outside. So who bring their own, right? If they're commuter students, they might bring their own mentor from an outside agency. So um, there's probably like a good, I don't even know, 50 to 60 of those. And then there's another, you know, 12 of our Syracuse City School District students have uh, their mentors are, are su uh, supported by the Syracuse City School District. So those are school district staff. So uh, we have really, um, I would say, a robust uh, supports but students get those supports in a really wide variety of ways. So it's kind of, this is sort of a hard question to answer. Um, some of those mentors work only two hours per week. Some of those mentors work 40 hours per week. So uh, it's, it's a huge range uh, and really a lot, of, uh, a lot of moving parts. Lisa, Liz G says, if a student takes one class for each of the first two semesters, can they attend for more than four years? Uh, okay, and that's another great question. So uh, we have had that happen in the past. We, we try to keep it to be a four-year program, but we have had some students who might take their classes in four years and then spend their fifth year doing their internship instead of doing three years of classes in their fourth year as the internship. Uh, so that's definitely a possibility. Jason asks, if a student is coming from out of state, how does the Medicaid waiver work? Uh, and that's another really good question. Some states are theoretically reciprocal with Medicaid waiver. So if you have a Medicaid waiver in another state, um, it is possible that you might be able to use your Medicaid waiver uh, in New York. For example, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, and Connecticut are theoretically reciprocal states. Now we've been semi-successful with using Medicaid waiver from other states in New York, but only partially. So we've only been able to apply that Medicaid waiver in uh, partial ways. So they'll pay for like a section of the program, but not for the whole, whole thing. So we have some students that might be able to pay for two classes or be able to pay for just an internship or be able to pay for one, one thing or be able to pay for just a mentor support or something. And then they have to figure out how to pay for the other pieces, either through scholarship funding or through private pay or through um, financial aid or through something else. Uh, I'd yeah. love to figure out how to get it to be more reciprocal. More right. reciprocal. It's a problem with a 50 state system. Yeah, it would be coming from Texas. I don't know what Texas situation is. I don't either, but it would. We would love to try to figure it out. Uh, yeah. It would be something to ask if you have a Medicaid broker or a Medicaid care coordinator. I'm not sure what the what they call them in Texas. Yeah. Um, but if you have someone that would like to try to uh, talk to the Medicaid system there and think about if you could transfer benefits to New York State. Okay. That Thank we'd, you. We'd love to. We're always trying to push the envelope, always. Uh, because, you know, when we do it, it's, it's good for everybody. Right. We, there have been things that we've figured out that now other colleges and universities are using. So the more we push, the better it is for the whole field. Okay. Um, Allie says, my son just got community hab. Would we need to change to self-direction before fall? He's a senior this year. Um, you technically could use community hub to support your, uh, your mentor hours if that is one of the things that you wanted to do. But if you wanted to be able to pay for, if you wanted to be able to use your hours to pay for the whole, for your tuition, for your um, fees, for your courses in addition to your mentor support, then yes, you would need to change to self-direction. Yeah, um, and you would need to do that fast if you're applying for next fall because the state is really backed up and not moving very quickly on uh, the Medicaid waiver. 
in fact, trying to do that by this fall, I'm not sure how fast they would be able to do that. So you might wanna to talk to your um, care coordinator to see if it's possible. Sam says, go Bills. Okay, uh, do we pay extra for the residential mentors and peer-to-peer -peer support? Um, residential mentors, yes, um, that is an extra cost. Peer-to-peer -peer support, no, that is included. Um, peer mentors, if, the, if you need a peer mentor or um, a student support assistant for courses and for other things, yes, that can get billed through. If you're, if you're using um, self-direction, that can get billed through Community Hub. If you are, um, if you're just talking about the peer-to-peer -peer support for like social things, um, that is included in our program. Uh, but residential mentors, yes, that does cost an extra fee. And um, some people can put that into their self-direction budgets or um, can, uh, it, it can get supported with financial aid. Dustin and Lisa ask, where do the students that live in the dorms eat? Uh, they eat in the, uh, there are, actually, Sam, do you want to answer this question? Sure. Um, so yeah, our students eat in the residence halls, just like every other Syracuse University student. There are a couple different kinds of residence halls on campus. The more standard kind of residence hall meal plan experience is you go in, you swipe your ID, and it's uh, kind of an all-you-can-eat buffet, which can be challenging for our first-year students. I know when I was in my first year of college, it was challenging for me. So it's a learning experience to be presented with literally whatever and how much of whatever you can eat. And so part of that learning experience of freshman year is, is figuring out how to navigate that, how to create healthy plates for yourself, things of that nature. Um, it's also worth noting that there are other places to eat on campus too. Um, there are other resident or there are other dining halls that just take cash uh, where you can go in and there's like a Panda Express or a Chipotle or things like that, where you can go in and just buy whatever you'd like in, in whatever quantity you'd like. Um, but I would say a majority of our students, because you have to have a meal plan if you're living on campus, are eating at those kind of all you can eat style dining halls. Um, I also see the next one was related to residential. So I'll jump into that too from Christopher, Christopher and Gwen. Um, is there a limited number of residential slots as compared to total number? Yes, there is. Um, so traditionally we're only accepting a certain percentage of our overall admits as residential students. Um, and the reason why we're doing that is we're trying to build out our residential systems and um, strategies for all of how we support students residentially in an incremental format. Um, and so we do typically look at how many students are leaving residential and how many students do we want to add in order to have a good growth, but without stretching us too thin. Um, so yes, uh, we're typically admitting around 20 to 25 inclusive these students per year, but not all 20 to 25 of them would be residential students. Oh, and the next one's residential too. I'll yeah. keep rocking. Um, uh, from Dustin and Lisa. Uh, yes, I mean, <laughs> there are a myriad of lessons learned, so many lessons learned from now being in our fourth year of having students live in the residence halls. Um, and I actually wanted to talk a little bit about this at some point, so I'll kind of go off on this little tangent here. I think the biggest thing we've learned is what students can do to best prepare themselves for this big transition into a more independent living style of life. And so the, I, I kind of like push out to all of y'all to be working on a few different things to make sure when you come to uh, Syracuse or another program like us that you are prepared for this huge transition that you're encountering uh, where you're gonna be living more independently. And so to, I would say that um, students working on things like basic kinds of time management stuff around waking up, going to bed, doing those kinds of um, 
activities uh, as independently as you can, working on working through those, being able to um, set yourself up for success in the morning, knowing when you need to wind down at night so you get enough sleep. So when you go to classes, you're not falling asleep. Things like that are really important skills to be working on. I already kind of talked about the dining piece of things that can be a big transition. So starting to work with making some of your own plates and in deciding to yourself, is this enough food? Is this too much food? Working on that is really good skills to be working on right now. Um, I would say another thing that students can work on is navigation. Um, a lot of what I say to a lot of our freshmen is that Google Maps can be your best friend for a semester. Learning how to use Google Maps and other navigation apps to figure out how to get from where you are to the building you need to be, those are things you can start practicing now at home. You can um, jump, you can go out into wherever you live, your residential neighborhood, and pick somewhere four blocks away and type it in on the map and, and walk there using that navigation tool. Those can all be really, really helpful ways to kind of get you ready and make this big transition less daunting. So I'd say those are some things that we learned in terms of how we can um, best support students to come in and be more ready for this transition. Um, I would say another thing we learned in a more positive aspect is that the overall community of, or of Syracuse University and the residence halls is extremely open and welcoming. We've seen so many students make friends because they lived in the residence hall and because their neighbor or someone down the hall they became friends with and these relationships continue throughout even their time once they leave that particular hall. Um, I just got a message from a, a student and their mother yesterday saying, oh my gosh, uh, you know, two Syracuse University students came and picked up my daughter and brought her out to dinner last night to kind of congratulate her on an awesome semester. Um, so there's so much social good that can come out of this residential system. And I think that's a really great lesson that we learned as well. I could talk about this all day. I'll stop for now. I don't want to belabor it. Um, but thanks for that question. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we are out of time. We um, tried to answer the rest of the questions in the chat. So if you asked a question and you didn't get it answered out loud, uh, hopefully your question got answered in the chat. And I think we got to just about everything. We appreciate you being here. We look forward to your application, whether we're getting it this year or next year or the year after. Uh, we're so glad that you're here to explore with us. We hope that you come visit. We can't wait to meet you. And uh, thanks so much for, for coming tonight. And we hope that you have a really wonderful holiday season. And uh, thanks for joining us. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everyone.